All right. A very pleasant, a pleasant morning to one and all. Uh, on behalf of the Women in Engineering Committee, thank you for being virtually with us today. We extend our warm welcome to our guest speakers and to our audience. Today, the 23rd of June marks the International Women in Engineering Day, and we're here to celebrate it with all of you. We are celebrating the legacy and future of women leading the way in research and industry. We are celebrating the work of our hidden engineering heroes who have been working behind the scenes during this unprecedented time. We're here to celebrate you and shine the brightest spotlight on you. We're here to recognize your efforts and convey a humble thank you. Engineers around the world have played a major role in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, the extraordinary public health crisis that we are all experiencing has brought into sharp focus how they also deliver and maintain critical services and infrastructure, keep civic society functioning at every level and support lives and livelihoods. They are also undertaking world-leading research and innovation to tackle long-term and new global challenges of our time in various fields. Here at the University of Oxford's Department of Engineering Science, we are proud of our women in the engineering field who work tirelessly in building innovative solutions to the never ending problems. The Department of Engineering Science has an international reputation for its research in all the major branches of engineering. And in emerging areas such as biomedical engineering, energy and the environment. It also has an excellent record of engagement with industry and has generated numerous successful spin-out companies. Women have and will continue to be an integral part of the engineering community at Oxford, and we are celebrating their achievements today. Today, uh, we have invited some of our best and brightest female engineers who have either graduated and joined the industry to create a change or who are currently working on exciting research at the university to solve major challenges. They are here to inspire us with their work and stories and share with us their unique journeys. Lastly, without taking any more of your time, I call on our guest speakers to introduce themselves to you as well as elaborate on the core details of their work as engineers. We will end the flash talk series today with a Q&A session so please feel free to post your questions in the chat box. We will start off with Dr. Katya. The podium is all yours now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maitha. That was a, a very generous and very kind introduction. As, uh, as you'll see from my, from my introduction, I'm not necessarily the traditional engineering career path, but hopefully you will shed some light about all the opportunities that with an engineering background, uh, you might have. So thank you for the invitation and the introduction, and I'm certainly looking forward to hearing from everyone in the panel. But just to kick things off, my name is Katia Mandalti. I'm the business development manager for Oxford Heartbeat. We are a digital health company developing medical software to assist with decision making before high risk surgeries. I'll tell you more about what we do at Oxford Heartbeat and what I do at Oxford Heartbeat in a moment, but just first to introduce my background. I'm a biomedical engineer by training. I moved to Oxford from Greece to study what was then the undergraduate degree of engineering economics and management. Uh, the core module was engineering science and I took up more and more biomedical engineering courses along the line that really drew my attention. Um, as you said, it's an emerging field and back in that day, uh, biomedical engineering was a relatively new standalone discipline, if you can call it that. And I really found the research at Oxford, as you mentioned, a really fascinating example of interdisciplinary applications with a lot of, um, especially, you know, young minds, women and men um, uh, working. So it was very exciting field and following my undergraduate degree, I joined one of the doctoral training centers in healthcare innovation at the IBME at Oxford, uh, and eventually joined the team of Professor Yanis Ventikos and Dr. Paul Watton. They're both now in different institutions, but at 
the time I worked on their team um, focusing on the computational modeling of the cardiovascular disease of aneurysms, um, which are those bulges in the arteries, um, often in the brain or in the aorta that can rupture and cause bleeding. Um, my PhD focused on trying to understand and model the complex mechanobiology of the arterial wall, so how the biology of a uh, progressing disease might also alter the mechanics of the artery. Um, the clinical outlook there was really to eventually um, have a clinical tool that can identify the risk um, that an aneurysm might rupture. Of my research was far removed yet from a, a product or a clinical, but that was the clinical need for the research I was doing at the time. And it was during my PhD where I met and worked with the, in the same research group as the founder and CEO of my current company, uh, Oxford Heartbeat, um, Dr. Katerina Spranger. Um, our paths deviated for a bit after our PhDs. Um, I don't, that's where the non-traditional engineering career path come, come in because during my PhD and afterwards, I did a postdoc at Sheffield University, still within the space of cardiovascular modeling. I was becoming more interested in the aspects of commercialization and science communication. So really what happens or what needs to happen for an early stage developed um, healthcare product to get to the hospitals, to the clinicians, to the patients that they needed most. And that's when my career took a bit of a different turn. I joined a boutique consulting uh, in London, a small company that specialized in building commercial strategy for products that haven't yet entered the market in the biotech and medtech spaces. For example, I worked a lot with pharma companies that were developing drugs that were normally at that point, usually at, I mean, during phase two trials. It was a completely different world, but where I think the engineering background and especially um, the PhD really helped me not only to understand the science behind the products, but also to have a very methodical approach to problem solving, even though both the questions and the answers to were very different to what I was used to. Um, after about three years, I felt I needed a change from the business consulting life. I was staying in touch with Katerina Spranger, the CEO of Oxford Heartbeat. I was really interested in how they're doing. And after a few discussions, it became apparent that there is a role and a need for someone with my background in the company, um, meaning someone um, who, while has a technical background, wants to work on building and implementing uh, the strategy for a growing startup at a turning point uh, in their journey. Um, so I guess this is as good time as any to explain what we actually do at Oxford Heartbeat. Um, our first fully developed product is called Precise Neurovascular. It's an AI software that helps surgeons prepare and rehearse brain stenting surgeries, making them more predictable, more efficient, and thus safer. Um, brain stenting surgeries are, um, what are they? Okay, so stents are small spring-like devices, typically only a few millimeters wide. They're surgically inserted in the, art, in the diseased artery where the aneurysm is to tr or treat several diseases, including aneurysms. Um, and those procedures are minimally invasive and have to be extremely precise. Getting the stent size or position wrong by less than a millimeter can really render the procedure unsuccessful. And it's a really fascinating procedure. What I mean by minimally invasive is that with a small incision that normally happens in the femoral artery in the groin, in the groin, um, the stent leading, led by a catheter is um, guided by the clinician who is a radiologist, also trained as a surgeon, um, guides the device up through the arteries to, to the brain where the aneurysm is and opens up the device that holds the artery together and prevents the blood flow from going into the aneurysms, um, preventing the pressure that can cause rupture and strokes. Um, it all happens under live x-rays because they can't actually see what's going on. It's only a small incision. It's not open brain surgery. And as such, it has fewer associated risks um, compared to open brain surgery. But an unsuccessful surgery can have devastating patient outcomes such as uh, strokes, which the surgery was trying to prevent in the first place. And the clinical reality at the moment is that 
20% of patients currently have to undergo the trauma and risk of repeat surgeries with 10% of these devices, each costing more than 10,000 pounds being discarded annually. So there are many complications still, even though they are remarkable, incredible procedures uh, and cost healthcare costs unnecessary to healthcare um, systems of you know, billions across the EU and US every year. Um, the really tricky thing and where we come in is that clinicians have no means to consistently and accurately choose what is the best stent for each patient. In most cases at the moment, clinicians use remarkably 2D images or rudimentary 3D images and quite literally draw where they want the stent to go and try to understand which device will work best, which is clearly operator dependent, prone to errors, um, definitely not consistently accurate. And one additional complicating factor is that those devices acting like springs can change shape significantly inside the patient anatomy. And there is no clear rule to understand which one, what they would look inside. So which one will fit the best. So that is where our software comes in. It re aims to remove those preventable risks, risks and associated costs. With Precise Neurovascular, which is a C marked, fully C marked product, uh, the software allows clinicians to plan surgeries in real time and rehearse the whole patient case in, within five minutes. Um, Precise automatically um, selects the best fit for each patient, aiming to standardize clinical practice, make it more precise, consistent, and consistently accurate. We are very proud that we've demonstrated excellent accuracy of simulations of over 96%. And we're currently gearing up to start pilots in the NHS, which is the turning point I was referring to for every healthcare startup, gathering the clinical evidence, not just of the accuracy, but also of making a difference and an impact in, in clinical practice is crucial. Uh, we have more than six trusts from Southampton to Edinburgh recruited, and the pilot project is fully funded by the UK government's AI in Health and Care Award, uh, which is an incredible opportunity for us. And we're very excited about this, and we have exciting plans for other products and projects in the future. <clears throat> in terms, to wrap things up, in terms of my role, I work with our team of engineers, software developers, project managers, but also with a network of collaborating clinicians, industry and startup specialists to expand our reach, ensure we have the resources for our research and development plans and work really closely with the CEO, Katarina, to build and execute our short-term and long-term strategy plan. So I'm an engineer at heart, but at least currently I'm more interested in understanding and contributing to what it takes for a technology to reach the purpose um, it was developed to serve. So this is a very quick introduction, hopefully shed some lights. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from everyone else. Thank you very much, Dr. Katia. And we wish you all the best in your upcoming endeavors. Uh, now we will be moving on to our next speaker, Dr. Tia. Please, the mic is all yours. Oh, hello. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to such an exciting event. Um, I actually have a presentation, if that's OK. Um, if you could give me the. I just need the access from the host, whomever that is. Um, OK, I don't seem to have access to the to being able to share. If anybody is able to give me access, that would be great. Sorry, I've just made you a co-host. It just took me a moment. Thank to you. you. <laughs> Apologies. Ah, stressing out. <laughs> okay, let's now search through my multiple tabs. <laughs> okay, so yes, I have a presentation because that's the type of gal I am. Right. Um, so, hello, I'm Thea Eakins Coward. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Industrial Phycology. And phycology is a strange word, but we've industrialized it. It's the uh, study of seaweeds and microalgae. And I'm going to show you how we're trying to utilize the power of algae to clean our wastewater streams. 
I have a confession, much like Usher. Um, I didn't want to be an engineer. I wanted to be a marine biologist. So uh, for my undergraduate, I studied marine biology. And then I became interested in the fact that microalgae are like these little cellular factories. So I did a PhD in chemical engineering. And then I started to understand that there's so much potential locked up in these little cells. In order for us to unlock that, we really needed to um, approach this as an interdisciplinary team and collaborate with engineers and biologists and physicists. And so by being a chemical engineer, you kind of are that um, stepping stone between all of these different people and you can collaborate with lots of different people. So how do we use this exciting cellular factory to solve problems? Um, Currently, at the moment, unfortunately, only 14% of our UK rivers and streams are considered of good ecological standard. A lot of that problem can come from us. Um, every, every one of us is putting out two grams of phosphate per day, per, um, per person per day. So that can cause major issues through eutrophication where algae bloom. They then have a mass die off and that kills um, fish and aquatic systems. Currently within the UK and across the world, we use metal salt dosing such as ferric um, sulfate or ferric chloride to remove the phosphate. And this system has been going for years and years. It's, it's a well-known process throughout the water industry. It works really, really well at high levels of phosphate. However, when you get down to these lower levels that we need to achieve to in, improve the qualities of our UK rivers and streams, there's no longer a linear relationship. Um, the Environments Agency has also um, requested that the uh, UK water companies reduce their um, phosphate loads from around 2 milligrams to around 0 0.5 milligrams. So there's a massive reduction in these targets that they're trying to meet. Um, in order to meet these for um, a lot of our smaller rural water treatment works, you need to have really great um, assets on site. Um, you need to have good um, level of training for the operators. And then also these chemicals, the, the sludge that they create can be quite toxic. So there's a lot of limitation to utilizing ferric going forward. Um, we believe that phosphate removal using um, a biological phosphate removal system is going to be an important technology going forward within the UK water industry. You can utilize and recover that phosphate that you recover using microalgae and use it more as a circular economy. So instead of just seeing it as a problem, it's now um, a resource and a tool that we can utilize for things like biological um, fertilizers or inks or, uh, fillers within, hmm, what's that term? Resins. There you go. <laughs> um, we've also discovered that, you know, you can, for every one kilogram of algae that we're creating, we're removing 1.83 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So it's a step towards an, a, a, a net carbon zero treatment system. So we've known about algae within wastewater treatment for the last 50 years. And when I talk to the water companies, they're a bit like, algae, no, we've been there, we've done that, we're not so interested. And their problem is that they have these massive footprints. So this is in uh, New Zealand, and you can see it on Google Earth, and it's covering several hectares. Um, that's to ensure that you get good light penetration, not so good within the UK, where we've had uh, torrential rain recently. You also have these really good, really long residential times, uh, retention times, required for the removal of phosphate that can be like two to eight days and if you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of liters of water coming into a wastewater treatment process the treatment time needs to be in hours not days they found within these high rate algal ponds that the removal of nutrients could be really unpredictable um, and the treatment efficiency can be really dependent on things like temperature and light and photo period so it was studied for a long period of time. And when you use these algal treatment ponds, they find that they couldn't find an obvious connection between the amount of algae um, and the amount of phosphate being removed. Um, sometimes it was actually releasing phosphate. So as a water um, 
operator, I would not be so interested in algae. So how has iFike flipped that information? Um, we tried to develop it as more of a chemical engineering principle. We wanted to create a formulaic and consistent treatment, and we wanted to utilize the algal cell as a catalyst for phosphate uptake. So we knew that every time that we put an algal cell near phosphate, it was going to take it up and it wasn't going to be like, oh, is it going to release phosphate? Is it going to cause more of a problem? We also wanted to minimize the amount of sludge that was being produced remove um, phosphate in reasonable time frames, so within hours, and we wanted to meet these new very low targets that are needed to improve um, the health of our environment. Um, so we are targeting these small rural treatment works that will help um, water operators meet their new corporate social responsibility and also meet new legislation in an economical way. So how does it work? Why is our process so different to um, a high rate algal pond or other algal systems? What we do is we take the final effluent and we add a process, uh, uh, and we've coined it conditioning. We've, we've currently written a patent around this and this is what I've been leading as the chief, in, chief scientific officer. Um, we add it into these internalized lighting um, reactors we create a very small amount of algal biomass and then a very clean polished effluent that goes out into the environment and then we break down the process so we're not constantly bombarding the cell with phosphate we're giving it this time to recover so how does that compare to when you're utilizing algae traditionally the red line is when you depend on al uh, algal growth for the removal of phosphate as you can see Sometimes it goes down and sometimes it goes back up. But when you've created an algae as a biocatalyst, you get a very um, stark drop and it's a very linear relationship. So even in the best environments where you're growing algae, this is in a tubular fence bioreactor, you can see that it takes about 200 hours to remove five milligrams, whereas we can do that within 11 hours. Um, or here, depending on the ratios of the environment that you have, five and a half hours. Um, we've trialed this in a batch system at 25,000 litres in Western Supermare um, and getting consistent removal down to this 0 0.5 level. What's also interesting is that it doesn't just target phosphate. We're, by using a cell that um, is living and no longer using a chemical, it's got multiple pathways that it can utilize. So not only can we remove phosphate, but we can also start targeting ammonium, which is really toxic to fish and aquatic life. So we see it more of a holistic treatment method. We've also found that it can remove other um, emerging contaminants such as metals, including zinc. So we're currently commissioning our first um, commercial uh, product in Broad Windsor, which is owned by Southwest Water. And that's where we are, are at the moment. So it's a really exciting time for um, IFIC. We're um, trying to really change the way that we treat our UK uh, wastewaters, the way that we see uh, our water as an asset. And we really want to try and improve the UK rivers and streams health by utilizing the natural power of algae. So thank you very much. Sorry, that was a bit of a, poor start with the old presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tia. That was really interesting to hear from you. Uh, now we will be moving on to Dr. Jane. Hiya, uh, so I would like to share my screen as well. Can everyone see my screen now? Yep. Okay, cool, thank you. So hi everyone, I'm Jane. It's a pleasure to be able to share some of my experiences here in this uh, meeting. So I'm gonna talk about uh, a research that I've been doing in the past year, and then that's focusing on rapid diagnostic technology for SARS-CoV-2. So initially I'm a postdoc researcher at Oxford University and um, in February this year, I joined the startup company uh, coming from this research project. 
So um, as everyone know, COVID uh, has been uh, significantly effect, uh, affecting everyone's life in the past years. And then this is a literature review that I did uh, last June. And then at that time it's, on, it's about 6 million confirmed cases for COVID. And I was just checking um, the data list today and then it's already 178 million um, confirmed cases by WHO. So no need to uh, stretch out further that uh, this disease uh, indeed significantly affected everyone's life in the world. So um, having a disease infected is what's the most effective way to uh, kind of contain it. In addition to treatments, a diagnostic is one of the key. So to identify the patients or infectious uh, infected subjects as soon as possible, that uh, is one way to uh, kind of inhibit or prohibit the spread of the disease. And a lot of de um, detection technology has been focusing on qPCR, but in our project, we are looking into using another type of technology that can provide us a faster and easier way to detect uh, infectious diseases, and that's called LAMP. So what exactly is LAMP? So LAMP is a loop-mediated isothermal amplification method. So it has been developed since uh, 2000, um, but after them, there are uh, certain uh, technology de uh, developed from this technology for all various types of infectious diseases. But I think only until uh, SARS-CoV-2, it has been even more widely used um, for detecting uh, SARS-CoV-2. So the difference between LAMP and qPCR, there are a few uh, major characteristics. Uh, one is that um, as it's name uh, is an isothermal amplification technique. So it can uh, amplify the products at a constant temperature as around 65 degree. And this gives us a huge advantage on, um, we don't need any expensive or a sophisticated, um, sophisticated uh, uh, device, for example, a uh, thermocycler, we just have a heat block or even a water bath that can uh, remain that temperature will do. And another difference is um, the primer design is a bit different compared to qPCR. In general, we have two primers targeting one single target gene, while LAMP we are using two or four, uh, two pairs or three pairs of primer uh, targeting the gene. And then that can also facilitate the speed of the whole reaction. So as uh, this is just a general, um, process of how LAMP uh, was used to amplify the targets. And then it's a bit different from uh, qPCR that specifically amplify one single sequence. It will actually amplify its own product as well, and thus um, providing a phasal way to uh, detect the applicants in short period of time. So it's in general uh, uh, very ideal for detecting uh, any viral infection. So again, a bit um, comparison between LAMP and widely used conventional PCR. Um, LAMP is isothermal reaction, and then there's difference in primer design. Uh, LAMP also uh, have high sensitivity and high specificity. And again, compared to PCR, uh, LAMP only need to have a simple and expensive instruments. And there are different ways to read out a LAMP. One of uh, is colorimetric and uh, also fluorescence, but PCR in general is fluorescence. And then for fluorescence, we might need to have a more expensive or more sophisticated uh, equipment to read out fluorescence signals. But LAMP actually gives us a choice on reading it just by colorimetric changes and that can be detected by naked eyes. So this is just a general, uh, re the results that we usually see in the lab. Um, a, as a proof of principle, um, at T equals to zero, uh, all the reagents remains pink. Um, the, the idea is that once there's any amplification take place, the amplification process will release the hydrogen ion and change the pH indicator in the reagents, and then thus show us um, the yellow results and indicating it's a positive uh, results. Uh, for, for this specific test. 
So we have different primers design targeting different SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS region, and then we're adding um, the RNA targets to make sure that our uh, primer works for the specific targets. So we see that um, indeed um, our uh, design work. So uh, having the templates inside the reagents, we do see that the, the color change, um, the, the reagents manage to detect the, the targets in the reagents. And then we also have negative control that shows that um, the primer that we design is not targeting the human without any viral targets. So all good, uh, the first um, colorimetric asset is done. Uh, and then we are looking into moving along to use it um, in, in the real world scenario. So the actual uh, test kit that we have is actually a lipidized product. So the advantage of lipidizing the reagents is that it can be kept at uh, room temperature or four degree, we don't need cold chain. And that's significantly uh, improving the availability or accessibility of the tests. And then again, as a proof of principle, we add in a different samples, uh, four positive and four negative. After 30 minutes at 65 degree, we do see a change of color. And then the dry test kits uh, work similarly to uh, the degree of the wet reagents. So after we have that, uh, we want to uh, use it for a real world application. And then by having, uh, by uh, with for applying to the CE mark, we actually need to have a startup company and uh, the application need to be done by a legal um, entity. And that's why that we spun out this company called Offset. And then these are the original um, academic funders and the original research team we have for this project. So Professor Zhang Feng Cui and Professor Wei Huan um, in engineering department are the main drive of this project. And Dr. Monique Edison has uh, supported us with a lot of um, help on the clinical aspects and then also conducted the clinical trial uh, for this specific uh, product. So uh, the overall timeline of Oxid, um, we started the project in generally uh, since the, the coffee outbreak in China. In March, we have uh, our first patent filed and then we have publications published in May. And then we also have the C first CE mark approval for this specific product in August. And then later on, Oxid uh, was acquired by Prenetics. So currently we are underneath Prenetics, but Oxid will still have the uh, capability and freedom to do uh, certain research, developing uh, more technology using LAMP. So again, so uh, after a clinical trial, we have the CE mark clarification uh, decoration um, certificates for our specific products. And now this product is being used in some of the testing sites. So to kind of um, recap some of the advantage of using LAMP, um, we can remove uh, the needs for cold chain and then we will be able to provide a rapid turnaround time compared to general qPCR that is uh, usually, they usually need to take about two to three hours. And then it's a sample process and then we don't need to have uh, expensive or sophisticated uh, equipment and then it's scalable and then it can be accessible to a wide uh, um, range of users. Where we are at the moment, we have deployed our test at various sites. Uh, for example, the airport sites, um, Sky, we have different partners. Um, and then this is just a few that we were listing in the beginning and then we are still expanding our partnerships. So this is just a general location of uh, different uh, collection points that we have. And then looking into that a bit more, we have um, the scale up our tests and then deploy our tests in multiple uh, airport sites. And then it is very exciting to see that, how we can make it um, in a real world in such a short period of time. And even in the airport, we can have high standard um, lab um, doing the test for general population. 
So this is just a summary uh, mentioning uh, some of our achievement in the past year. And then um, I think hope that uh, this research um, kind of more focusing on the research problem is, could be useful for, for all the audience here. Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing uh, everyone's feedback and discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Jane. That's a really interesting project that you've just presented. And we wish you all the best, of course, in your uh, upcoming projects. Uh, now we'll introduce um, Dr. Verda. Hello. Hello, everyone. So I need to share my screen if possible. Okay. And uh, you should see now, sorry, my slides, right? Okay, so first of all, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I will give uh, a very general uh, talk about uh, like uh, my research and what I'm doing in uh, relation to uh, perceptive and, and soft robots. So first of all, a, a, a short introduction. So I'm uh, actually a um, quite new member of the department. I uh, received my engineering degree from University of Genova, as well as my PhD in uh, robotics, working at mainly uh, developing technologies for tactile sensing for robots. And I uh, spent postdoc uh, uh, in Cambridge uh, starting to work on soft robotics and I joined the department in September 2018 as associate professor um, and I'm now in the process of establishing my group uh, in robotics. Um, in particular like my research work want to, to look at like uh, providing robots with new capabilities so we we're usually used to see robots like uh, in manufacturing environment where uh, they perform a very repetitive task with uh, no human interaction and with very um, few uh, sensing uh, capabilities. Uh, usually uh, they rely mainly on, on vision. But we were looking uh, to expand their usage in very uh, different domain and definitely uh, in situation where they need to safely interact with the environment and with us and perform a very um, diversified tasks in a, a highly dynamic and unconstrained environment. And for doing so, we need to equip them with uh, uh, new capabilities. And looking from uh, nature, uh, we can uh, see how like biological organisms exploit the softness and compliance of their body to deal with uh, uh, very uh, like a different kind of environment, uh, uh, harsh environment, very dynamic. And uh, I mean, I'm always fascinated by the video of these octopus uh, here trying to escape from uh, this, uh, this glass, but also um, this uh, other video is very interesting because uh, it shows, uh, sorry. Okay. Um, no, it's not able to. Okay. So that is showing uh, actually a dead fish <laughs> that uh, uh, like looks like it is swimming in a, in a flow of water actually is uh, completely dead but the body itself is able to sort out uh, a task uh, without uh, any uh, actually uh, active control and uh, other than that i mean another important capability is that uh, we exploit is uh, the, the sense of touch we use it like uh, in our uh, everyday task for manipulation grasping exploration full body interaction and reactive behavior and, and like these two uh, elements uh, actually interest me so much and I'd like to provide robots with this new capability. In particular, as I told you, I started by looking at developing uh, tactile sensing technologies for robots, in, in particular artificial skin that could uh, cover the whole robot arm. And um, 
provide them with the uh, extraceptive capability, so the ability to identify contact, interact safely with the uh, with humans and, and the environment. And like uh, here, you can see this. Uh, um, like actually is, is a patch of uh, uh, these uh, uh, technologies I, I developed uh, um, when I was in Genova. And uh, um, you can see that is uh, actually made by triangular module that are interconnected and made on a flexible printed circuit board. And uh, each of these uh, circle represent uh, what in our skin would be called a mechanoreceptor. Uh, it is based on capacitive transduction. So this is the same technologies that you can have in your phone. And this system provide uh, also uh, 16 bits of resolution. That means that you can detect and, and uh, um, have a, a measurement of uh, um, the pressure that is acting on uh, on the artificial skin this this technology has been also featured in um, uh, robots exhibition at the science museum and to give and like actually we use it also to uh, uh, like uh, cover uh, several robot bodies with this technology so uh, and these actually show the portability of the system on robots with uh, a very different body so actually we can uh, literally cut uh, and uh, and glue this uh, this skin on, on the different parts of the robot and to give you an, an understanding on what this looks uh, on, on, on the robot body here, you can see like a robot arm, an industrial robot arm has been covered with this technology. And uh, in the monitor, you can see what uh, actually the, the skin feels. Um, and in particular, it's interesting to notice how, I mean, like we can detect and, and recognize the, the, the finger and the contact pressure that my colleague is acting on. Uh, performing on the robots and like the the color uh, get darker depending on the pressure that that uh, the amount of pressure is applying on the robot this kind of technology is very useful for example um, for uh, navigating uh, safely in the environment here you can see the the robot arm that actually doesn't have any vision or a knowledge of the environment that is in front of him and he's actually navigating through this uh, uh, pillar like uh, just by um, reacting uh, thanks to the tactile sensing that uh, uh, is provided by the, the, the skin. And so actually he, the robot knows only uh, the uh, goal position of, of the switch but doesn't know anything about what uh, is between uh, him and, and, and the switch that he has to turn on. And he's actually reacting uh, thanks to the sense of touch. So this is actually very important when we uh, don't have uh, the, the availability of vision or when vision is impaired. But also we can use this kind of uh, uh, system to uh, retrieve uh, um, like information about the physical properties or tactile features of object we manipulate. For example, this is uh, uh, an example of this end effector that has been covered with the, the tactile technology that is able to recognize edge, so it perform edge detection, and it automatically, autonomously can actually follow the edge of, uh, of this mark in particular. Uh, so this providing additional capabilities to the robot that can uh, uh, retrieve important information for uh, manipulation and accomplished other type of, uh, of tasks. Well, as I uh, mentioned uh, before, I'm also interested in uh, like uh, looking at providing a robot with, with compliance. So we, we started like uh, to, to, to design robots with a rigid body. Um, Definitely because it's easier to control, um, and uh, uh, but uh, but like we wanted to 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 instead uh, uh, provide them with the more soft and, and compliant body, and like uh, to do so, I mean, soft robotics is uh, definitely a new emerging uh, um, uh, like uh, methodology for robots design, and like. Uh, um, it requires expertise uh, and uh, from very different uh, disciplines, in particular for material science, from biologists, uh, um, 
and 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 so on because uh, we need the definitely new kind of technologies for for building these robots uh, in particular uh, for uh, manufacturing for sensing and for uh, actuation here you can see some example of uh, type of technologies we used to to uh, to actually manufacture in these robots we we need a new material new smart material that maybe uh, can react to light or temperature magnetic material uh, to, to actually uh, actuate or, or, or provide this robot with sense. And we are also looking at new methods for manufacturing, in particular silicon casting, but also uh, 3D printing is definitely a, a new technology that we are, we are looking into to design very highly integrated soft robots. But of course, I mean, like, Despite they, they, this kind of compliant body can provide uh, adaptability and uh, like uh, safety uh, during interaction, they comes also with a lot of challenges in particular with uh, uh, problem in controlling them because they are, um, they can deform theoretically in an in, uh, like infinite way. Uh, so definitely it's difficult to apply classical uh, control uh, to uh, this kind of system, we need also to develop new technologies uh, for sensing and, and, for example, stretchable sensors uh, that can actually uh, be integrated on, on the body and without actually affecting the, the compliance of it, but also we need technologies for stiffening because definitely we can exploit the compliance, but we want also them to be able to, to, to uh, sustain weight and to um, uh, actually um, be able to stiff when necessary. And we are looking also to new material to provide the self healing. So uh, uh, like when they are uh, deployed in, uh, in the like, uh, real world scenario, they can actually uh, self heal after uh, damaging. Um, so here, I mean, I show you something that we are we're doing in, in uh, like about the development of soft robots in particular. We started to do to design and 3D print uh, uh, integrated uh, uh, soft actuator that can be uh, pneumatically actuated. And to give you an example, I mean, here you can see that the CAD and, and, and like uh, um, some capabilities of the robot, but I show you this video uh, where you can see um, like the, uh, the, 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 the gripper in action. Actually, um, this kind of gripper are very interested for uh, manipulating uh, very soft, delicate object, in particular, uh, the um, uh, agri-food uh, uh, application as uh, I interest in this kind of gripper because they can uh, adapt very easily to object with different shapes. And uh, so this definitely simplify a lot the control. Uh, in this case, what you can see here, is the control of the gripper is completely open loop. So, uh, and, and is able to, to accomplish the task. Also, this is like uh, to show the manufacturing of this system. This uh, allow like a customization and uh, um, uh, actually, uh, we can design manufacture a system that are very cheap and uh, um, like uh, we can produce them very, very fast. I'm also interested in uh, like looking at, uh, 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 for example, uh, exploiting. Uh, this, this is uh, actually a work that I'm doing in collaboration with Professor Jong, the engineer department, is an expert of uh, origami. And uh, we are looking at exploiting like uh, um, uh, origami uh, Japanese art to design a new type of, uh, of gripper that uh, also um, can be trendy printed. In this case, we started with uh, a water bomb. Uh, you can see all the process from the um, uh, zero thickness water bomb uh, uh, origami uh, towards actually the design of an assembly of different water bomb uh, with a thick panel origami and uh, the achievement of uh, a uh, gripper that can be actuated with just one, one single motor. And to give you an idea of what the gripper can do, actually, uh, what is interesting is that the origami structure allows us to have a very clear kinematic um, but actually the fact that we have uh, very compliant hinges allow also uh, us to adapt to object with different shapes. So we can, 
exploit the two advantages uh, in, in, in this case. But also we are looking at developing uh, soft uh, harm and uh, in particular, uh, um, this is like a, um, a type of robot that we can exploit like to, to reach uh, and to navigate in very difficult environment where rigid robots are not uh, well suited. In particular here, um, like we were simulating different type of uh, scenario and looking at uh, um, like the ability of this uh, uh, soft arm to actually easily uh, move around and uh, trying to um, uh, look at the other side uh, with a camera that uh, was uh, integrated on the as an end effector actually. And uh, here you can see the camera view uh, of uh, uh, that is attached on the robot and. You can see how the robot can actually squeeze <laughs> easily uh, between like the, the obstacles and uh, um, and and show uh, like uh, very flexibility uh, uh, with a different kind of uh, of environment. Yeah, these kind of things is very difficult to be done with with a rigid robot. And um, and finally, I mean, we are also working on uh, new technologies for soft sensing. In particular, this is a three D printed sensor uh, that is adaptable. Uh, that means that we can actually uh, actively change the uh, pressure that is inside this uh, soft chamber, uh, and this way change the, the sensitivity of uh, this. Uh, um, uh, sensor is a pressure sensor, and we evaluated. Uh, uh, we performed several simulations to evaluate the, the, the performance of it, uh, uh, like by using different type of uh, uh, materials uh, uh, that di with different kind of stiffness, but also uh, changing the uh, internal pressure and evaluating like uh, uh, the, the sensitivity of, of the system. And in this case, I mean, you can see like some preliminary experiment we did by uh, looking at the response of, uh, of this sensor and in particular uh, on in the top, you can see like the, the variation of uh, the pressure data that we collect from, from the sensor. And, and we tried uh, uh, like, um, to uh, use it with uh, different type of objects, so um, uh, to check uh, like the sensitivity of the system uh, in different uh, condition. So of course we are still working on trying to uh, achieve a more large area um, uh, system from this preliminary start, and um, and that's uh, I think it from myself. And uh, I want to thank you for. Uh, uh, listening and looking toward the uh, final session later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Perla. That was a really interesting research that you are doing over there. Uh, now we will be moving on to Dr. Chiara. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me and see me? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, am, I can share my screen. So, all right. Can you see it? All right, so good morning everyone. And first of all, again, thank you for uh, um, inviting me to this very nice event. It's been a pleasure and it's been very interesting to uh, hear about uh, um, the other researchers and professors uh, working in the department and in the companies. So uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about, not technically, <laughs> talk about uh, what does an aircraft engine have in common with a microchip. But first, uh, um, I'd like to a bit uh, share this with you. So what I really like of uh, uh, being an engineer and uh, working in uh, the engineering department in Oxford is that um, as researchers and as engineers, we have the uh, great possibility and chance to shape our society and trying to, let's say, um, improve uh, the, the impact and reduce the impact of uh, um, the technologies that you're using. 
So uh, what I really like is that engineering brings together technology and society and uh, give us the chance of uh, actually make, make a change. So my sector, which is the transport sector, because I work for aircraft engines, is, uh, uh, of course, as you all are, are aware, uh, is uh, impacting uh, the environment uh, quite uh, <laughs> um, strongly. So uh, essentially, we need uh, uh, creative ideas and radical changes in vehicle and propulsion systems to um, reduce uh, the, the impact. And uh, um, so for this reason, we are trying to develop a, a novel and hybrid concepts. You, you probably have heard about uh, electric uh, vehicles and uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid engines, uh, maybe using hydrogen or other um, fluids in supercritical condition. And this is a bit what we are working uh, on now. So to give you a bit my my background, um, I, I started as a mechanical engineer in a, in Italy, and then as a student, I uh, participated to a few exchange uh, programs. So I visited uh, uh, Paris and and the Netherlands for my master thesis project, and after that, I started my PhD at EPFL in Switzerland on uh, electronics cooling. So we started um, developing uh, micro evaporators to cool down uh, CPU and uh, using, using um, liquid, liquid cooling and uh, evaporative flows. After that experience, I went for a um, few months at, uh, in the US, where I also continue working on uh, uh, electronics cooling, exploiting uh, two-phase flows. But uh, uh, in this case, uh, instead of uh, cooling, let's say, one single chip, one single CPU, we were interested in developing a cooling system for a data center rack. After uh, this experience, I joined uh, the University of Oxford, uh, the Oxford Thermofluids Institute, where I'm working now, and essentially moved from electronics cooling to <laughs> aircraft uh, thermal management systems. So essentially the problem is the same, but uh, the scale and the, let's say the system I'm working on is uh, completely <laughs> different. So returning back to my title, uh, what does an aircraft engine have in common with a uh, chip or a data center is the need of uh, dissipating heat. So all of these technologies uh, uh, in order to be more powerful they, they, they will generate more heat. So the problem is really simple. The, the more densely packed CPU or <laughs> aircraft motor they get and the more powerful they get, the more hot they become. So uh, temperature is really affecting the, the efficiency of all of these uh, systems you see in the pictures. And uh, uh, novel cooling systems are required to keep improving these technologies and uh, improve their efficiency. So this means also reducing their uh, environmental impact. This is uh, essentially what I am uh, working on at the moment uh, at the Oxford uh, Turbine Lab, where, um, well, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, sorry, you can see our facility. This is uh, the Oxford Turbine Research Facility is essentially a uh, short duration uh, piston where um, air is uh, compressed by a piston and let's say simulate the, um, the aircraft, the, an aircraft engine. What we are uh, particularly interested in is to uh, develop uh, um, and investigate the fluid behavior in, in the turbine when it is uh, cooled down by uh, hot, uh, by cold air. And to do that, uh, I'm in particularly now developing an infrared uh, thermography system. So you can see the picture on the uh, bottom left. This is a, an infrared uh, thermography map of a blade tip seen uh, from, the, from the top. And uh, thanks to this uh, uh, nice technique, we can, uh, let's say, uh, target and tune our cooling system, our design, in order to make it more efficient. The, uh, the problem with this uh, <laughs> technology is that uh, 
the, the current cooling method, so air cooling, is a bit uh, obsolete and uh, will not be enough for uh, higher uh, power engines and or same for uh, electronics or higher power electronics. Uh, actually, uh, I put this uh, image of the elephant because uh, essentially air cooling is still the method used by elephants when they flap their ears. They, they essentially try to exploit air cooling to cool down their brain and keep it below a certain uh, right temperature or the same as when we try to drink a hot soup. So we believe we can do a bit better than that. And so next step of our research is try to develop a, a novel cooling uh, solutions uh, that are, uh, as, I, as I explained, are essential to develop uh, future hybrid and electric aircrafts. And uh, um, the idea is to try to exploit uh, advanced uh, um, cooling methods such as uh, liquid cooling or two-phase flow cooling uh, that I developed for microelectronics and try to bring them on board. So essentially try to see my aircraft as a large, a very large battery. On the, um, well, on the left hand side, you can see again my, my facility here in Oxford that we are trying to upgrade. And on the uh, right hand side, you can see an example of uh, two phase flow cooling. So uh, we um, have, a, have a chip uh, completely uh, merged into a pool, uh, um, pool of, uh, um, yeah, into a pool of a refrigerant. And uh, the, the CPU is uh, heating up. So the flow is evaporating on, on, on the chip surface. And thanks to the latent heat of uh, vaporization, we can achieve a much higher uh, cooling rate. The question is, uh, the question for the future is, can we try to bring this on board and uh, uh, help developing a novel heat exchanger design for electric uh, aircraft? So <laughs> I was less technical than um, <laughs> previous talks, but I hope you, you enjoyed it. And thank you very much for, um, for this invitation again. Thank you very much, Dr. Chiara. This is really interesting, whatever research that you're doing in cooling. I hope that you will succeed in the future and come up to more solutions. Mm -hmm. um, now we'll be moving on to our PhD student, Carla. So it's all yours now. Hi, um, I also need to share my screen. So if you could um, enable me as a co-host, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Oh, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for the invite to talk to today. So I'm gonna to be talking about my research. I'm a second year DPhil um, based at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering and I'm supervised by both Professor Mark Thompson and Professor Hu Aye. Um, so my research um, focuses on research on traumatic injury. Um, basically, traumatic injury is one of the most relevant but neglected health concerns in the world. And it has been increasing ma mainly due to more and more falls in the elderly population. But also um, there has been a, a significant increase in road accidents, which also leads to um, severe disability later on. Um, and although the major risk of traumatic injuries is imminent death, um, there is also quite a large population that um, develops later on prolonged disability. And it, this has major socioeconomic impact, both on their welfare, but also on their families and communities. Um, so currently trauma research focuses mo mostly on what we've been doing on the clinical side. So this is mostly looking um, at follow-up follow up, um, on patients um, and their recovery, but also looking at the clinical markers they display. Um, however, there is, some shortcomings associated with this kind of research because um, we're not able to subject patients to trauma in a somewhat controlled environment due to ma major ethical concerns. Um, and also we cannot do this kind of research um, and look at very short or immediate um, 
consequences. So to do this, um, other types of studies have been uh, put in place, mostly in vivo, but there are also some ethical concerns um, on subjecting um, animals to, um, to trauma on purpose. Um, in vitro studies are currently um, on the rise, but there is um, still quite a lot we need to, to do to get them up to speed. Um, so um, in order to gain a fundamental um, understanding into trauma, uh, we need to create a platform that is physiologically relevant, um, a reliable system, um, and that it is also able to replicate the environment that would be um, occurring in a natural setting. Um, and to, um, to address this, my BFIL project uh, proposes the development of a vascularized by artificial muscle model for trauma research. So this is um, a general overview of my project. Um, in the first section, I am developing um, an in vitro model. So I'm looking at two different options. The first one, um, I'm just doing a microvasculature within a gel. So these are just human cells um, um, in the field cells, and then they create um, a network very similar to the, the capillary networks we have in the body. Um, and then in a second stage, I'm developing a bioartificial muscle. So this combines both skeletal muscle cells and, um, and the filar cells. And once these have been um, created in, a, in, a, um, in, the, in the dish, then they, due to the mechanical forces, then they form um, a, a micro uh, muscle, which is then subjected to traumatic injury. That is the second stage of my project, which is subjecting these two different types of in vitro models to a traumatic injury, mostly contusion. Um, and then I'm looking into different variations of the environmental parameters, mostly oxygenation. So in decreasing the oxygenation levels, but also variations in the temperature to see whether or not this has any impact on both the injury and the repair and um, regeneration of the tissue afterwards. And the idea is that at a later stage, once this model has been optimized, this will be used as a platform for therapeutic treatment um, and evaluating whether or not the whether or not um, su supplying uh, different factors before or immediately after injury will have an impact on mitigating the, the, the damage or accelerating um, tissue repair and regeneration. Um, and then, so that, that was my um, BFIL project, but then I briefly want to touch up on um, another project that came um, as a result of the COVID pandemic. So last year, when um, the COVID pandemic was onset in the UK, um, we created um, a, a, a team of medics and engineers from the universities of Oxford and King's College. Um, and we developed um, a mechanical ventilator for COVID-19 patients. Um, and then we were selected to participate in the UK's ventilator challenge. And we were then partnered up with um, Smith & Nephew, which is a company that is based up of North and they do mostly wound healing um, applications. So we developed this ventilator, which is shown here, um, and this is um, a low cost, uh, rapidly manufacturable uh, and reliable ventilator. Um, and so some of the things that we were doing is that within the first week, um, we had a working prototype. And from then on, we were working on different iterations and then at a later stage, we were working on um, evolving the design so that it would be rapidly manufacturable uh, at a large scale setting. Um, and then we migrated into a social enterprise um, and we were looking currently beyond the UK. So we've partnered up with um, companies um, in India, so JRG Healthcare and Aroba Ingeniería in Mexico. Um, and basically the idea is that what we've developed, uh, we are continue to um, to work on, will bring um, to other markets and um, people, um, because there is currently still a strong need for mechanical ventilation. Um, and beyond the pandemic, we expect these, uh, this ventilator to be used um, for humanitarian settings um, and low resource settings as well. Um, and then, well, this is, um, this is my group. So I would really like to thank um, for the support and the guidance of both my Oxford Mechanobiology group and the tissue engineering group. Um, and then this is just a short list of the people who have been involved in the Oxford project. But there have been so many more people involved um, and it's mostly people from Oxford, uh, King's College London and Smith and & Nephew and yeah that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Carla and we wish you all the best in your thesis. Uh, you. Now uh, we have last but not least uh, Jana it's your turn now. Hello 
Um, so uh, my name's Jana and I'm a DPhil at the Oxford Control Group. I've not prepared any slides today. I just wanted to share with the audience um, a, a, an introduction to my work, how I got into it, because it might help those of you thinking of doing a PhD or thinking about going into control engineering. Um, so a bit about me, I'm a Bulgarian, but I came to the UK originally back in 2013 to study. And since then I've been part of three universities now, and I've completed a bachelor and a master's in aerospace and control systems. And for a very long time, I thought that would be it. I'll get my master's degree and I will go work in industry, but an internship completely changed my mind. I was working um, for the summer at Marshall Aerospace and Defense Group, and it was a unique experience. I was working on an operational um, airport, and every day I was meeting with all kinds of professionals from test pilots, avionic engineers, aerodynamicists, all sorts of people. And I really used that opportunity to speak to all kinds of professionals in order to see where I would fit in the aerospace field. And it quickly became evident that if I wanted to do the specific career path I had in mind, I would need a PhD because um, that's uh, the level of education that most people in that position had in the company. So from there, my first big research was um, working on optimizing the shape, uh, the cross section of shape of a plane's wing. And the idea was to maximize the, the lift to drag ratio. And I created a very basic simulator and optimizer, which would provide the optimal shape given a user specified angle of attack and conditions of the flow. From then I moved to my PhD work, which is also optimization based, but in a completely different context. Uh, today I work with the control group, as I mentioned, and for those of you who have, who have no idea what control engineering is about, broadly in control, we use mathematics and physics to um, just describe and predict how a system will act and also devise methods to control it. And many of us, including me, try to control the system optimally. So for example, if you want a car to go over a hill, how would you control it to do so with minimum fuel? Or if you're trying to park your car, how would you do so with the minimum number of maneuvers or in a minimal uh, time? Um, my work specifically focuses on simulation, optimization, and control of multi-rate systems. And multi-rate is just a fancy way of saying that the system has both slow and fast movements. For example, if you take a pianist's arm as a system, when they're playing the piano, the arm itself would be kind of slowly moving up and down, but the fingers might be moving very fast. So that's one example of a multi-rate system. Um, there are many others from the motion of molecules to the motion of planets. There are all sorts of examples of multi-rate systems. The example and application I've been focusing on till now is satellites. And our methods um, are uh, try to exploit the multi-rate nature of the satellite in order to reduce the computational load in controlling it. And that's really important for spacecraft because they have limited capacity hardware. Another um, main goal of our work is to preserve, when we mathematically describe the system, to preserve certain characteristics that are essential for the simulation. For example, if you take a conservative system, it is known that a system's energy remains constant if there is no external work done on it. Energy can be converted from one type to another, but it, it cannot be lost. However, if you simulate a conservative system with a standard uh, simulation method, usually what you'll get is that the energy will actually decrease in time when you simulate it. And that is due to an effect called numerical dissipation. And if we look back at the satellite example, this could be safety critical, this issue, because in spacecraft, you need long-term control in which you're trying to respect very stringent positioning and fuel usage requirements. So we have to avoid such problems, uh, hopefully. So overall, the main idea of our work is to exploit the multi-rate nature of these systems and also preserve very important characteristics in order to provide high fidelity simulation and control at a reduced computational cost. And 
I, I focus on aerospace systems, but as I said, this uh, work can be applied to many other uh, applications and hopefully will help uh, research in many other fields. The reason why we focus on aerospace systems is because I would like to pursue a career as a researcher in the space field. And uh, apart from my work uh, in my free time, I really focus on teaching and popularizing the aerospace field. With uh, Oxford Aeronautical Society this year, we put up many events where we try to showcase people from all over the world, their work and different career paths in the aerospace industry. We really hope to encourage students to um, pursue a career in aerospace or at least in STEM. And if at the end of this talk, if you have any questions about my work, about control engineering, uh, your future, or you just want to discuss with someone how to continue uh, your career path, I'm, I'm really happy to listen and just discuss with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yana, for all of this information. I think it's really um, interesting to hear all of that, your experience growing up and how you've become an engineer. Um, Thank you. So with that, uh, we've actually uh, concluded the uh, talks. So now, is there anyone who has any questions that they would like to direct to any one of our guest speakers? Janet, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, thank you all for these uh, absolutely wonderful talks. Uh, this is really one of the most uh, interesting events in the department I've ever uh, participated in. Um, now, uh, the, um, a, a big um, interest of the, of the faculty, and I think this is a, a UK-wide interest, is, is more um, support for career development. Uh, so I thought um, uh, maybe one of the people who had talked could just talk about what was um, most useful to them in terms of you know, making decisions that you made. Can you uh, think back to some decision points you were at and uh, suggest what was really useful and helpful to you in, in making the right decision? And I, I realize I'm um, pitching my question to too many people at the same time. So, so my team might have to uh, um, uh, tap somebody if, if nobody volunteers here. <laughs> So who would like to take the question? Our guest speakers. I'm, I can take a stab at it. <laughs> I don't think I can stand uh, too much in silence. Uh, so uh, thank you, Janet, for, for the question. I, um, it's a difficult question because it's always easier to see it in retrospect, in hindsight, to what led you where, where you are now. But um, I certainly think that one of the um, I, key things that helped me and, you know, in theory, I've changed careers already a couple of times um, is to really try and um, and consider where I want to be maybe um, like five years down the line and the kind of work environment and the type of people um, that I want to work with and really speak to anyone who will hear. <laughs> uh, I think I've had the best suggestions for career moves just by trying to explain to people what I would like to be doing. And I've had some excellent suggestions about where to look at some things that turn out to be, you know, internships, um, or jobs or just considerations for me. I know it's a very general one and very generic thing to say, but I think we underestimate how much we can learn from other people's experience and a different, you know, perspectives, I guess. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, uh, yes, indeed, thanks so much. Anyone else would like to pitch in their thoughts as well? Um, I have a question, sorry, is it Perla, um, your robotics? Um, I was just wondering, I, I'm an amputee and, um, you know, there's a big discrepancy between research 
and what is accessible to someone to use via the NHS. Do you see that there's much um, potential for your kind of um, sensing robotics within prosthetics? Um, and do you think that that's achievable within a funded limited environment? Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think definitely there is uh, um, like room for exploiting these technologies in uh, like, uh, let's say prosthetics and, and, and medical application. Definitely, I mean, uh, soft robotics open up uh, also uh, a lot on this respect because uh, of course uh, we are talking about robots that are safely uh, the, to, to, to interact with. And, and so there is a lot of research uh, uh, devoted to the use of this kind of robots in, in medical application. Um, also from the point of view of uh, the like tactile sensing technologies, uh, uh, definitely the technologies that, that uh, I uh, developed can be integrated easily on a prosthetic end. Um, I think that at this stage, uh, what is uh, like the majority of cost is not the technologies hardware, it's really the, all the aspect of the, the integration that is uh, custom actually for all the different devices require human power to, 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 uh, to do it. And, uh, and so this is actually still uh, manual work. <laughs> and, uh, but in general, technology itself is not so expensive even because we use the, um, commercial off the shelf chips like the capacity uh, the capacity digital converter that are using phone so actually trying to uh, keep down the cost of these kind of technologies i also worked uh, in uh, by exploiting these sensitive technologies in other domains so like for example uh, looking in like in the context of uh, um, an epsrc project working with the university of cambridge and imperial college london um, uh, related to, for example, uh, developing robots for uh, uh, training uh, practitioners, uh, for example, in the palpation diagnosis, but also developing robots that can actually perform palpation diagnosis, so actually exploiting sensing technology and sensory motor coordination um, to, in order to actually uh, check uh, about uh, abnormality in, for example, uh, organs and like... Uh, in the abdomen so uh, definitely this uh, this is a a, a good uh, application scenario for for us and i mean and also soft technologies are usually cheaper than <laughs> other type of robots because we can exploit definitely uh, uh, like uh, 3d printing so uh, and uh, uh, like rubber based material that are definitely cheaper than previous type of robots Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, that was a big delay. <laughs> I was on mute. No problem. Okay, um, Kiara, it seems like you have your hands up. Uh, yes, <laughs> let me switch on the video. I was just uh, um, curious to, uh, to ask uh, um, Professor Maiolino if uh, uh, for their application, um, Temperature is uh, uh, somehow something that you include in your studies, either as a sensor input or as a, a practical, I don't know, limitation for a certain application. Maybe when you shrink the, your robots to very low size, I, I wonder if uh, in, in your area there are some uh, thermal uh, issues as well. Thank you, Chiara. I mean, definitely. I mean, it can be sometimes an issue, sometimes we can exploit it. Uh, for example, from the point of view of the artificial skin, definitely, I mean, capacitance uh, uh, is affected by temperature and we can have uh, like drift. So, of course, in a measurement system, uh, like the drift due to, to temperature, and especially when you put, for example, a sensor closer to motors, uh, that actually actuate the robot, uh, this can be a problem, right? So we actually had to in implement uh, at uh, um, 
at hardware and firmware level, a system for temperature compensation. Uh, and, and so to avoid that actually the measurement of the sensor drift uh, like uh, with the temperature. So in this case, it was an issue and we have uh, to find ways to um, uh, like overcome this, this problem. In other situations, temperature instead can be exploited. And as I told about the soft uh, robots, we can definitely use material that are uh, um, that have a behavior that is temperature dependent uh, to achieve some sort of actuation. We are now looking at, for example, uh, at the um, and how temperature affects the uh, young modulus of certain material we use uh, to change uh, the like uh, the capabilities of our robot. So in that case, uh, for example, temperature can be uh, something we can exploit to achieve some new capabilities uh, for actuation or sensing as well. So. And definitely, <laughs> both the, the situation can, uh, we, we found both the situation, yeah. You showed that sensor that was uh, uh, touching the cup and then touching the bread. For example, in that case, if I remember, you were measuring a force or a pressure. But I was wondering if the sensor was a temperature tip, you might, so when it's in the air, you have a certain uniform temperature. And as soon as you touch the other body, you will have a step change in temperature. Maybe that could be another, depending on the application, but. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. There is the interest of also like of multimodality. For example, uh, um, like this, case, I mean, our skin can definitely feel also temperature, right? So, uh, for example, the temperature is something that's important to distinguish between, I don't know, wood and metal. I mean, when we touch them, okay, even if they are the same exact obvious, but like, like th thanks to the temperature, we can uh, like distinguish them. So uh, definitely to also use temperature sensor or to exploit like the... Um, uh, temperature dependence capabilities of the materials, we can use it uh, like to actually uh, for, for this kind of purpose. So, uh, yes. That's just curious. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, and uh, actually from YouTube, we do have uh, one more question. Um, there's someone who said they have attended an online event and there was this company called Space Perspective, which sends people to the space for six hours trip. Uh, did you hear about this company? And what do you think about the commercialization of those aerospace engineering technology, which seems, which seems to be hot evident by other private leaders like Jeff Bezos? Who would like to take on this question? Chiara, go ahead. No, it is the old hand. Uh, and sorry, I don't know how to unraise it. <laughs> sorry. I'm happy to take it. Could you just repeat it, please? Yeah. Uh, so they're basically asking about um, this company called Space Perspective, which sends people to the space for six hour trip. So they're asking, uh, what do you think about the commercialization of those aerospace engineering technology? Um, so we recently made an um, event with the aeronautical study about space medicine. And what we discussed is that there are still a lot of challenges to sending um, people in space, especially in space tourism, but it's very, very important to do these things because we're learning from every one of those experiences we're learning. And also space has been very restricted so far. Um, I myself am Bulgarian as, and as a Bulgarian, I couldn't participate in the ESA selection this year. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity for people to go up, but we should all know what the risks are, understand, and just learn from all these experiences. These ventures are great as long as we know what we're doing and we learn from our experience. Thank you very much, Yanni. So with this, we come to a conclusion to our event. Uh, we would like to thank our guest speakers for these interesting presentations and information about their research and work that they have been doing so far. And we also want to thank our audience for joining us into this event. So we wish you a happy International Women in Engineering Day, and we hope to see you in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.